Many of us software engineers dream of building unicorn businesses. We think about the millions of users, the constant scaling, all the challenges involved in that. For me, I can't lie, entrepreneurship was a major reason why I got into software engineering in the first place. Software is one of the most straightforward types of businesses to launch in the sense that you don't need some kind of physical product. And that's fantastic. That being said, you still need to validate your idea and create some kind of decent MVP if people are actually going to use your product. I've recently gone through this experience when launching my new platform, Startup Grad Jobs. Now, I managed to build this much quicker than usual, and I actually launched it for literally zero dollars. I'm using something called the Van Stack. I didn't invent this stack, I didn't write any of the tools or anything like that, but I think I'm the first person to call it Vans. The whole philosophy is based around pragmatism, speed, and scalability. Something I want to note is that this is kind of a one size fits all for SaaS applications. If you want something highly specific, customized or niche, this may not be for you, but I still think it's a great option to start with whatever kind of company you're building. I figured the easiest way to structure this video would be to go through each step of the van stack and then go through some of the gotchas that people would maybe try and hit me with. So let's get started. So the V in the van stack stands for Vercel. I believe hands down right now, Vercel is 100% the easiest way to deploy any application. Literally all you have to do is connect your GitHub account to your Vercelic. Then from there, you just select the required repository and click deploy. From there, it will give you the option to map it to like a real domain, but it will also assign you some domains out of the box. It's so easy. Now, whilst that by itself is fantastic, my favorite feature of Vercel is probably its preview branches. So let's say I've submitted a new pull request with a new feature and I want to be able to test it out. Before my pull request merges, so while it's still open, Vercel will actually deploy a preview branch for me. So I can then go through it manually, have a look about how everything functions, maybe change my mind on a couple of things. Now, and believe it or not, that's actually saved me on multiple occasions from deploying something wrong. The added benefit to this as well means it's great for doing UX research. You can just send over that preview branch to someone before you've even merged it to get them to test out a new feature, see what they think, get some feedback. And all of that is available in the free tier. If you go for the pro tier, then they can leave comments and things like that. It makes your life so much easier. Now, Vercel's always launching new features, so this is probably going to be out of date even by the time I post this video, but there's a ton of extra stuff you can do. In terms of practical usage though, something else I like is the simplified cron jobs. If you want some kind of script to run repeatedly at a certain time, you can and instruct that really easily in just one config file. For example, for me, if on a Monday morning, I wanna send an email to all my users talking about the new jobs we have on the platform, I can just do that with the cron job. Almost every SaaS platform is gonna be using a cron job somewhere. So it's really handy to have them so simplified. My final major point about Vercel that you should consider is that it actually works really well with another part of the stack, Next.js. Now I'm gonna talk about Next.js a little bit later, but Vercel are the official maintainers of Next.js. So you're gonna have first class support for anything Next.js. And because we're gonna be building this product with Next.js, it makes it so much easier. Now, the funny thing about Vercel and some of the other tools that I'm mentioning in this video is that they are built on top of a very well-known tool, and that's AWS. I've chosen to include AWS in the stack for a number of reasons. Primarily, it's because it's what the services are using under the hood, so it's important to remember that and factor that into your decisions. It can also give you a good idea of cost estimating, time estimating, about whether it's worth doing everything in AWS manually or using the van stack. Now, for me, I'm far from any kind of DevOps wizard, so that's why I I've chosen to use the van stack. It means I don't have to get my hands too dirty in AWS. A lot of my auxiliary functionality also runs on AWS, so I use Plunk pretty heavily. Now, Plunk is actually a fellow indie makers tool, so big shout out to Drius who created it. It's an amazing email software and it's kind of that missing link. I definitely recommend using Plunk. Kind of hits that midpoint between something super raw like Amazon SES uh, and something like ConvertKit, which is more of a like all-in kind of model. But I'm sure you have a rough idea of what AWS is and because we're not using it too much hands-on, I'll leave it at that. Today's video is brought to you by Zero to Mastery Academy. Now, I first learned React, which is a key aspect of this stack from Zero to Mastery. I've been struggling to self-teach for a long time and the way Zero to Mastery framed things around real business problems was really helpful to me. They have a massive catalogue of high quality courses available under one banner. You can pay a subscription fee and cancel any time to access all the courses. It's a flexible monthly subscription to access all the courses. They have courses on a wide variety of topics. As I said, I learned React using it and I've been a professional developer for the best part of five years now. And as I've mentioned, I'm building a product. It genuinely works and I highly recommend it as a resource. And now back to the van stack. Now, the next aspect is Next.js. 
Next.js is arguably the most exciting thing to have happened to web development in the last 10 years. It's a full stack framework using React and then either TypeScript or JavaScript, depending on your configuration. For me personally, I use TypeScript and I recommend you do too. Despite it having a reputation as taking longer to develop in, over time you'll actually save yourself time. If you want to build something super quick and dirty, then yeah, it's fine to use JavaScript, but over time stuff like static typing is going to be very helpful and things like auto automatic suggestion of interfaces and that sort of thing, it, it makes your life easier, trust me. So in terms of the developer experience, the primary advantage of Next.js is that everything is in the one repo, regardless of if you're using Next 12 or below or Next 13 and above. All the routing is file based, so you don't have to worry about creating some kind of router object. It's all done under the hood for you. For example, here, if I navigate to startup grad jobs slash candidates, we go to our candidate landing page. And in the code, I don't have to do any kind of configuration. I just have the candidates file, which then at root automatically routes to here. Another key advantage using Next.js is the fact that our front end and back end code is using the same language, which makes it much easier to work with. You don't need to context switch or anything like that. It's all in the same repo and we can jump around super easily, make changes on the fly. It's great. Something to note recently with the new version of Next, all pages are now server-side by default. Now, server-side rendering is actually a very important thing for SEO. The reason for this is that search engines are actually gonna know what's on your page because it's already preloaded, if that makes sense. The content's there. Whereas when you have a plain React app using something like Create React App or V, there's no information at first, which is what the crawlers interact with. So if Google are crawling through loads of pages, they'll basically snapshot the first thing they see. And if there's no information on there, then how do you expect to rank well in SEO? This stack always comes back to commercial viability. And of course, SEO is absolutely vital to commercial viability here. We're trying to launch a startup cheaply. Therefore, we can't rely on stuff like paid advertising. And that's where organic SEO is our best friend. Last but not least in the stack, we have Superbase. Now, anyone who follows me on Twitter knows that I am a massive fanboy of Superbase. Now, it's quite funny. If you go on their homepage, they just say Superbase is a open source Firebase alternative, but really it's so much more than that. I personally use Superbase to handle all of my database. It essentially functions as a backend as a service. It's great because it means I hardly actually have to make any manual backend calls. I can call a lot of stuff straight from the front end. Our, the databases are PostgreSQL components, which are performant, powerful, secure, generous amounts of storage buckets as well. So it's really easy to use. It may take a bit of time to get used to how the databases actually work in Superbase. I'd recommend checking out Kobe GM's free courses for this. I was actually lucky enough that when I first started using Superbase, GM jumped on the call with me and we went through uh, stuff like foreign key relations and stuff like that and I realized just how powerful it actually was. Another massive thing that I love about Superbase is that it handles all the authentication for me. You get up to 50,000 authenticated users per month for free, which is pretty crazy. It also supports all the major auth providers out of the box. So, you know, your email, your magic links, your Google OAuth, your GitHub OAuth, etc. I don't recommend handling authentication yourself regardless. Even if you choose not to use Superbase, I would recommend using something like Clerk to handle this for you. But Superbase is absolutely fantastic and it's getting better literally week on week. Ironically, even though it means I've abstracted away some of the backend work, it means I've understood backend architecture much better. So whatever your level, I definitely recommend using Superbase. And now I wanna talk about some gotchas because I know there's gonna be some comments telling me how I'm wrong and how I've made a terrible mistake and how I know nothing about software engineering. So first objection, isn't it expensive? Chances are no. The free tiers are very generous, so you can validate literally for free. And then once you're actually operating and getting some income, even the paid tiers on the lower level, you're gonna be spending less than $50 a month. So for a business that's making any kind of MRR, it's definitely worth it. And obviously cloud computing, even if it's all DIY, it's still not free, right? So you're still gonna be paying either way. That actually leads me on to the next objection that I get here. And that's that I can do all this cheaper myself if I build it all in AWS manually or whatever. And yeah, maybe you will build things slightly cheaper if you do it all yourself. But developers can be quite bad at not valuing their own time. If you're still in the validation phase of a startup, and particularly if you are doing this as a solo entrepreneur, you really just need to get the product actually out there and market it. What's the point in building some ridiculous enterprise grade infrastructure when you have zero dollars of MRR? There isn't a point. And you may say, well, it's feature proof. But the problem is most projects fail. Like I've had tons of failed software products. It's normal. If things start taking off and you desperately decide you do need a custom solution, then you can just pay a consultant to do it for you because you should be making enough money, right? And speaking of, another gotcha here is my use case is very specific and I need a custom kind of solution. And that's fine because I did say at the beginning of the video, it's a one size fits all framework, right? So that's fine. If you do need a custom solution of some kind, you can build one. But that being said, I still would recommend trying to do something fairly generic like this. See if you can make it work because you will save yourself tons of time. What's the point in reinventing the wheel? And if 
if you then decide, yeah, I do need to build all the custom stuff, more power to you. You can still use bits of the stack. It doesn't all need to be used together. And speaking of bits of the stack, JavaScript and TypeScript is slower and less performant than something like Rust or Go. Maybe that is true, but I believe the advantages of building everything in one language, which by the way, has an unrivaled dev ecosystem, far outweigh some slight performance advantages of doing something else. Again, the focus here is on pragmatism and shipping fast. Chances are your users just want you to fix things quickly. Think about the marginal gains of using something that's a slightly more performant language versus the marginal gains of being able to ship features that maybe are very, very slightly slower. What's actually going to win you more clients here? Remember, we've got to think about this more like a business person than an engineer. And that can be a hard mindset to approach because of course we are engineers and we code for a reason, particularly self-taught people. Like, you know, there's a reason why we spend hours and hours learning, right? We enjoy it. But if you just want to be pragmatic about it, you don't need to turn everything into a huge engineering challenge. And the final objection I get to this is, well, if I want to build really, really fast, I could just use no code. And if you're not an experienced coder, then yeah, absolutely. No code tools are a great option, but chances are, if you can customize it a little bit, why wouldn't you? And that's why if you already know how to code, I recommend you use something like this. Although if you're a non-technical founder who's just stumbled across this video, definitely try and build your MVP with no code. They're getting better and better tools. I've started to hear stories about people becoming profitable pretty quickly after using no code or getting investment, if that's the way they've gone. It's also a great way of validating your idea. So if you want to hire a CTO, you can, and you'll have more confidence in them. Now, if the product sounds interesting to you, do check out startupgradjobs.com and check out my podcast, The Coder Career, where I've talked about building this, but also as well a little bit about my career over the last few years from going from technical recruiter to software engineer.